In October of 1989, after a month-long trial, Jacobs is found not guilty. For 55-year-old Kenneth Kenny Kuntz, July 5th was shaping up to be another ordinary day. He hopped out of the trailer next to his family's home and went to the house to greet them. As he entered, he was met with a grisly scene. His entire family had been shot dead and left to bleed out on the floor. Kenneth was horrified by what he discovered and ran to the nearest phone to call police. In the coming weeks, investigators would struggle to find the culprit, leaving the community wondering who would kill this tight-knit family and why were they targeted? Welcome back to M7 Crime Storytime. Today, we're looking at the baffling murder mystery of the Kuntz family. The town of Bern, Wisconsin sits in the middle of the state and is part of the Wausau metropolitan area. As of the year 2000, only 562 people called Bern home. The town boasts a population density of 16.5 people per square mile and many families in Bern have the luxury of living on multi-acre properties. There's an abundance of parks, golf courses, and national parks, making Bern an ideal, quiet town for those looking to raise a family. At least, that's what the Kuhn's family, who called this home, had once believed. The Kuhn's family consisted of 70-year-old Helen Kuhn's, her son's 55-year-old Kenneth and 30-year-old Randy Kuhn's, and Helen's siblings, 78-year-old Clarence Kuhns, 81-year-old Irene Kuhns, and 72-year-old Marie Kuhns. The family were known in the community as being extraordinarily close-knit. Some even regarded them as being too close. The family resided in a dilapidated gray house on a 108-acre plot of land six miles from Burn Town Center. Those who had visited the family home and farm described it as cluttered and littered with items. The house had no indoor plumbing, and the family relied on a wood-burning stove to cook with and keep themselves warm. All but one of the Kuntzes, Kenneth, lived in the cluttered home. Kenneth had chosen to live in a trailer next to the house in a bid to gain some privacy. Despite the rundown appearance of the Kuntz home, they were somewhat wealthy. Between them, they had managed to store over $20,000 in cash around the house. The Kuntzes were thought to be a bit odd. They always paid their bills with cash and preferred to keep to themselves. The family mostly wore hand-me-down clothes passed from one family member to another and seemed to be exceedingly close. Kenneth and Randy would often drive their mother, Helen, into town so she could buy food and pay the bills. According to a Post Crescent article, the Kuntzes were treated like strangers in their own town. Some residents took a kinder approach to the Kuntzes but most residents regarded them as eccentric and bizarre. The Kuntzes would have faded into obscurity had it not been for a breezy July 4th evening. On July 5th, 1987, Kenneth awoke in his trailer, clutching his head. He'd spent the night visiting the cheese factory where he'd worked before going out for drinks with friends. With it being July 4th, Kenneth had downed a few extra beers and joined in with the celebrations a fact he regretted when he awoke the next morning. After dressing himself and getting ready for the day ahead, Kenneth gingerly walked out of his trailer and headed to the main home. He expected to be greeted by his mother, uncle, and aunts, but instead, he'd be met with a scene that would haunt him forever. As the front door hinges creaked, Kenneth shouted out to his mother, but there was no response. He closed the door behind him and continued to shout for her. He froze in horror when he took a few more steps down the entryway. His aunt, Marie, lay motionless on the floor in a pool of her own blood, and she'd been shot with a 22 caliber gun to the head. Kenneth moved around the home in a daze, hoping that this was some sort of nightmare he would wake from soon. When he got to the kitchen, he found that Randy had been shot and left to die in a pool of blood. Kenneth rushed over to him and tried to resuscitate him, but it was too late. Kenneth now knew he had to find the rest of his family members, and he began cautiously moving from room to room. At this point, Kenneth was unsure whether the perpetrator was still inside the home, and he feared that he might suffer a similar fate. Upon reaching the bedrooms of Clarence and Irene, he discovered both of their bodies. 
They too had been shot with a 22 caliber gun. Clarence was in his bedroom, whilst Irene had been found slumped in a chair. It was clear to Kenneth that this had been a surprise attack and his family had not had time to react or flee. A sickly feeling washed over Kenneth as he ran downstairs and out of the door. He ran to the nearest neighbor's house, banging on their front door. When someone finally opened the door, a jumble of words escaped Kenneth's mouth as he tried to ask to use their phone. Panic and fear had hijacked Kenneth's body and adrenaline was pumping through his veins. Finally, he was able to communicate with his neighbor and a 911 call was placed. Within minutes, squad cars with flashing lights and blaring sirens had swarmed the humble 108-acre Kuntz farm. Investigators briefed themselves on the situation at hand and the investigation was officially opened. Kenneth was the first person that the Marathon County Sheriff's Office wanted to speak to. After all, he had been the one to discover his family's bodies and the only one in the family who hadn't been harmed. During their initial interviews, Kenneth mentioned that his mother, Helen Kuntz, was nowhere to be found in the home. Whilst Kenneth was concerned for his mother's well-being, investigators couldn't help but be suspicious of her. In the early hours of the investigation, a motive had not yet been established and investigators were willing to explore all avenues. According to an article written by UPI in July 1987, the Marathon County investigators say they will not know if Helen Kuntz is a victim or a suspect until she's found. Would Helen really have the motive to kill her entire family and spare only her one son? Is it possible that she took her life afterwards? Could she have gone on the run with a new identity? These burning questions were placed on the back burner while investigators desperately scrambled to decipher what had happened that evening of July 4th. Crime scene investigators painstakingly combed through the Kuntz home. Their reports described how the home was filled with trash and debris and had no modern amenities such as plumbing or a proper kitchen. The family lived in squalor, never throwing anything away and letting dirt accumulate around the home. This struck investigators as bizarre. Not only did the family have a farm that provided a solid income, but over $20,000 in cash was found stashed around the home. It was clear to investigators that whomever had killed the Kuntzes did not realize that a substantial amount of cash was lying around. Adjusted for inflation, $20,000 would be over $52,000 today. Whilst the family lived in what could be described as poverty and squalor, they owned a TV and a video player. A rumor spread around the town like wildfire, which had only ostracized the family more. Gail Weiler, the owner of a local hardware store, confessed to the Marathon County investigators that in the weeks before the shooting, Helen had come into the store and purchased some 22 caliber bullets. Helen claimed that the ammunition was used by her sons, Randy and Keith, to shoot birds on the family's sprawling property. But that wasn't the most interesting clue that she divulged. Gail told investigators that Helen had complained about her family watching dirty movies together on the video player. This was backed up by the library of obscene material discovered in the Kuntz family home. Disturbingly, this was not the first time that rumors of deviant sexual behavior and incest had swirled around the family. Marathon County investigators uncovered a case file from the 1930s where a 40-year-old neighbor stood accused of attacking and impregnating a then 15-year-old Helen and was found guilty by the court. Not only this, but Kenneth also believed that his biological father was Helen's brother, Clarence Kuntz. The truth of these claims are unclear, but the family, especially Helen's mother, had always denied it. With the rumor mill swirling, more gossip came to light throughout the years. The people of Bern believed that Helen and her son Randy shared a bed at night, further fueling the Kuntz incest rumors. It was also reported that Clarence, Marie, and Irene, who were all siblings, slept together in the living room. The rumors of incest had persisted for generations, and now townsfolk wondered whether those relationships had come to a head. People continued to speculate. Meanwhile, Helen was still nowhere to be found. The people of Bern stood behind Kenneth Kuntz, even if it was at a slight distance. While the family was odd, and there were rumors of disturbing and disgusting behavior, 
the townsfolk still felt the pain of the massacre. People came together in the wake of Helen's disappearance and created t-shirts, buttons, and posters that said, Where's Helen? Appeals for information were launched, and everyone kept a close eye out for any sign of her. Investigators knew that Helen had last been seen at a fireworks display in Athens, Wisconsin, on July 4, 1987, a day before the slayings. Kenneth had been at work and then at the bar, so he was unable to shed any light on his mother's disappearance. People began debating whether a 5-foot-3-inch, 70-year-old woman could be capable of killing her entire family. As summer slowly transitioned into autumn, the thoughts of the Kuntz family floated to the back of people's minds, and the town of Bern returned to normal. Meanwhile, investigators continued their search for Helen and the person responsible for wiping out almost her entire family. But as the mystery thickened, authorities came across a baffling twist. Nine months after the massacre in April 1988, Helen's body was discovered in a marsh in Taylor County, Wisconsin. Like the rest of her family, she'd been shot in the head with a 22 caliber bullet. After discovering the body of Helen, an autopsy was performed, but any additional evidence uncovered has never been released. However, the investigation hit a dead end for a brief period after Helen, the presumed perpetrator, ended up having suffered the same fate as the rest of her family. Surprisingly, the 1987 shooting wasn't the first time the Kuntz family had experienced a tragedy like this. In December 1905, Helen's grandmother, Mary Kuntz, was found murdered in her home in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. The investigation was short, but ended in a shocking conclusion. Wenzel Kuntz, Mary's own son, had been charged with her murder. Wenzel had bludgeoned his mother while she lay in bed, leaving her to be discovered by the rest of the family. During his trial, Wenzel was found to be insane and was sent to a mental institution. Coincidentally, his brother was also a patient at the same facility. The Kuhn's family had significantly downsized by 1906, and in 1914, the remaining family members moved to Marathon County to start a new life and settled on a supposedly abundant farm. However, when they got there, they realized that they'd been lied to. The farmland they'd been promised was nothing but a wasteland of tree stumps and organic waste. The Kuntzes eventually made a name for themselves across Bern and Marathon County, but investigators struggled to piece together a motive. Over $20,000 had been discovered in the family home, ruling out robbery as a motive. Then, in January 1988, another twist arose in this already puzzling case. Investigators stumbled across new evidence that brought to light a suspect. The man was Christopher Jacobs III of Athens, Wisconsin, just a stone's throw away from Bern. Investigators had discovered that shortly before the murders occurred, 22-year-old Christopher had bought a car from the Kuntzes. He was one of a select group of people that had ever interacted with the Kuntzes. Many people stayed away from them because they thought they were odd or had heard the rumors, while others never had a chance to interact with them due to their reclusive lifestyle. Investigators found it suspicious that Christopher had interacted with this strange family and began to dig deeper. Upon searching his property in Medford, investigators found a car, two 22 caliber rifles, 22 caliber ammunition, spent shell casings, and newspaper clippings about the Kuntz murders. After a forensic examination of the vehicle obtained from Christopher's property, it was believed to have created tire tracks that had been left behind at the Kuntz crime scene. According to a motion filed to the Wisconsin Court of Appeals, Police had taken plaster cast impressions of tire tracks and footprints from the area around the Kuntz residence in their garden, located about a quarter of a mile from the house. In January 1988, detectives sought out Christopher Jacobs' car to see whether its tires could have made the tracks found in the Kuntz garden. Christopher was arrested in January 1988, and he was released without charge days later. To make matters worse, for months following his release, Investigators struggled to collect evidence while he was roaming free without a care in the world. It wasn't until August 1988 that the Marathon County Sheriff's Office knocked at Christopher's door again. He was rearrested and charged again and was informed that the case would be going to trial. Then in August 1988, Jacobs is charged with five counts of party to murder. 
His arrest started one of Marathon County's longest investigations. 22-year-old Christopher Jacobs III awoke in a prison cell on a warm August morning. It took a while to adjust to his new life of being told when to eat, sleep, and where to go. Throughout the process, Christopher maintained his innocence and retained a lawyer. Christopher's defense team knew that the evidence against him was circumstantial. The murder weapon was never found, and the tire tracks in his personal 22 caliber weapon were circumstantial at best. Christopher's lawyers spent months preparing their defense. In October 1989, the trial commenced. Crocker Stevenson, a reporter for the Milwaukee Journal, had been following the case closely, and when the court dates were made public, he made sure to grab himself a front row seat. He later recalled to the Post Crescent, they put a suit on Christopher and cut his hair, but he was a thug, and he came from a family who looked at these people, the Kuntzes, as someone they could victimize. As the town of Bern and the people of Marathon County are exceptionally interconnected, a jury was brought in from neighboring Brown County to ensure that Christopher was given a fair trial. For weeks, evidence was presented, witnesses and experts were cross-examined, and the investigation was scrutinized. A lengthy video of the crime scene was shown to the jury. Most of them found it stomach-churning and unwatchable as the bodies of the Kuntz family and their wounds were displayed on camera. Tire prints from Christopher's car and the crime scene were shown to the jury, along with testimony that he'd been one of the only people to have interacted with the family. The remaining Kuntz family and their supporters held their breath as the jury delivered their verdict. Christopher Jacobs III was staring down the barrel of a long sentence for a murder of almost an entire family. But in a shocking twist, after just 10 hours of deliberation, the jury found him not guilty on all charges. The courtroom was immediately filled with cries and shouts. Christopher gasped. He was finally free. As to count number five, not guilty of murder in the first degree of penalty. Yes. Christopher was released from custody after the October 28, 1989 verdict, but he wouldn't remain a free man for long. In 1993, Christopher's ex-girlfriend, Stacy Weiss, would once again stoke the flames of this bizarre and twisted case. She visited the Marathon County Sheriff's Office and asked specifically to talk with Lieutenant Randall Honish. As Lieutenant Honish clicked play on the tape recorder, he stared in disbelief at Stacy as the words spilled from her mouth. Stacy told Lieutenant Honish that in 1991, she and Christopher had been dating and that he had confessed to murdering the Kuntz family. When she asked him why he'd done it, Christopher replied to prove to himself that he was a man. Stacy would say that Christopher arrived at the Kuntz home on the evening of July 4, 1987, where Randy Kuntz greeted him. The two had built a good rapport with each other after Christopher bought a car from Randy, and Randy happily welcomed him into the home. According to Stacy, the two quickly became embroiled in an argument, at which point Christopher pulled out a 22 caliber gun and shot Randy. Christopher then moved around the home, systematically taking out the rest of the family by shooting them at point-blank range in the head. For unknown reasons, Christopher decided to tie up Helen and take her out to the swamp, where he shot her and left her body. Christopher was alarmed by this confession from his former girlfriend, telling investigators that she was nothing more than a jilted lover out for revenge. Unfortunately for Christopher, the Marathon County Sheriff's Office took Stacy's word, and Christopher was arrested yet again, this time being charged with the kidnapping and murder of Helen Kuntz. It would take five years for Christopher Jacobs III to stand trial, and investigators were glad they'd acted when they did. According to reports, the statute of limitations was due to expire just hours before Christopher was arrested for the second time. On June 8, 1998, Christopher Jacobs III stood in court again, awaiting his fate for a second time. Unfortunately, Christopher's luck had run out, and after just four hours of deliberation, he was found guilty of kidnapping and falsely imprisoning Helen Kuntz. Christopher Jacobs III was sentenced to serve 31 years in prison with a parole date set for February 2020. On February 4, 2020, the now 53-year-old Christopher Jacobs III was released from the Columbia Correction Institution after being granted parole. In a bizarre twist, 
Christopher found himself back in custody on February 5, 2020, at the Marathon County Jail. Strangely, he had ended up back in custody at his own behest, telling officers that he had no interest in parole and would rather serve the remainder of his sentence at the Columbia Correction Institution. However, he still claimed to the media that he was innocent and that the police had coerced his former girlfriend, Stacy, into lying about his supposed confession. He told the Wasau Daily Herald, Marathon County could be looking to hook me up on bogus charges to justify my false imprisonment. Shortly after my 1989 acquittals on all charges, I was told to get out of Wisconsin because police were going to retaliate. Christopher Jacobs III returned to jail in June 2020, opting to serve 14 months, which was the remainder of his sentence, behind bars. Many in Bern do not believe that Christopher killed the Kuntz family. The prevailing theory is that someone within the family committed the crime. However, with all but one of them now deceased, it's unlikely that we'll ever discover the truth. What do you make of this case? Do you think Christopher Jacobs III is guilty? Or is the actual perpetrator lurking elsewhere? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to our channel for more intriguing content.